As a type 1 diabetic who has tried both Neil Barnard's diet and Mastering Diabetes diets, I have to say they simply don't work for type 1 diabetics in most cases to keep completely stable blood sugar. The only one I've seen that actually works to completely control blood sugars that isn't a carnivore diet, which I really dislike, is Bernstein's regimen because it allows a large amount of low-carb plants to be eaten with every meal. The other two diets are fine if you want good blood sugars but don't want the rigidity of Bernstein's diet. When it comes to type 2 diabetics, there can be more flexibility with regards to diet because they have a better control in general, at least when the disease is new. So I'm actually really glad to be talking about this particular type of comment because uh, it's it can be quite confusing to understand how it's even possible to begin to increase your carbohydrate intake, especially to the level that we suggest, which is eating greater than 200, 300, sometimes upwards of 500 or plus grams of carbohydrate per day, while still maintaining great blood glucose control. And a lot of people have the experience of uh, trying to eat more carbohydrate and then finding that their blood glucose goes high in the postprandial state, which is after eating a meal, and then they get frustrated and they say, you know what, you're, I tried your approach and it doesn't work. So I wanna just sort of clarify a couple of things here when it comes to blood glucose control because especially in the world of type one diabetes when you're injecting insulin, there's many variables to take into account and blood glucose is one of them that's important, but uh, there's many other variables which you also have to pay attention to. So the first question that I wanna ask is, what, in, in a non-diabetic individual, what would be the ideal, what is considered an, an acceptable range of blood glucose variation? And the reason why I wanna ask this question is because there's many CGM companies that are new companies that have been around for a couple of years that are advertising their products to non-diabetic individuals and um, making claims like if your blood glucose goes higher than 120 milligrams per deciliter at any moment, then that's considered a quote unquote blood glucose spike and that's dangerous and that's gonna lead to worse long-term outcomes. And I think a lot of people in the world of type one diabetes also adhere to this information and they start to believe that if their blood glucose goes anything greater than 120, that uh, they're setting themselves up for long-term disastrous consequences. So uh, let me share some research about this topic because it's very important to understand. So there's a couple of papers I wanna draw your attention to. Uh, and these papers talk about what is a uh, glycemic profile in non-diabetic individuals. This paper was published in 2010. These researchers tried to determine what is a, a real blood glucose profile of those who are considered non-diabetic. And what they found was that, first thing, the cutoff for what is considered normal blood glucose variation versus impaired glucose tolerance does not happen at 120. That threshold is 140 milligrams per deciliter. So you can see right here, it says, we found that nearly all individuals without diabetes exceeded the impaired glucose tolerance threshold of 7.8 millimolar or 140 milligrams per deciliter at some point during the day and spent a median of 26 minutes per day above this level. So that's the cutoff. So right there, let's just, uh, recognize that that metric was not invented by them. This is a metric that has been known in the world of diabetes for a very long time, that any number greater than 140 is considered impaired glucose tolerance, and a blood glucose value between 70 and 140 is considered a normal non-diabetic blood glucose variation. Secondly, what they found was that glucose levels in persons with diabetes frequently reach this IGT range, meaning above 140, and that a considerable proportion reach diabetic levels on a normal daily basis. And you can actually see in a different paper the variation that some researchers have uh, discovered by putting continuous glucose monitors on non-diabetic individuals. So you see here in the evening hours, blood glucose is actually quite well controlled and nice and flat. But then starting at about eight o'clock in the morning and going all the way through midnight, you see these variations in blood glucose, and sometimes the variations can go greater than 140, greater than 150, and sometimes they can go as high as 180 to 200. Is that first one breakfast? Yeah, this is most likely breakfast right here in the beginning uh, of the day, about 8 o'clock a.m. Orange juice, bowl of oatmeal. Yep. What's, what's important to understand here is that this non-diabetic blood glucose variation um, of 70 to 120, which many uh, companies are now claiming is the only way to keep your blood glucose controlled, is actually too tight of a window. 
and that the window is likely needed to be expanded to between 70 and 140 in order to actually classify what is considered normal physiological variance in your blood glucose uh, profile. The question is, if I have a bowl of oatmeal and my blood sugar goes up to 140, is that a less healthy meal than if I ate something else, uh, like tofu scrambled and my blood sugar only went up to 100? It depends on your overall macronutrient profile. So I'm actually glad you asked this question because that was the next thing I was gonna go into, which is that paying attention to your blood glucose is certainly important. There's no question about that. But paying attention to only your blood glucose value and using that as a surrogate marker of your overall health is a slightly dangerous game that allows you to miss many other markers of your basal metabolism that are very important. So. I mentioned earlier that having a blood glucose meter is very helpful for people living with type 1 diabetes because it's a way for you to be able to determine whether or not the decisions that you're making right now are benefiting you or harming you over the course of the next two to six hours. And so it's kind of this, uh, this device which is constantly giving you feedback and that feedback you can use to then modify your decision making process, right? But What's important to understand is that uh, you're, this is only telling me my blood glucose. This tells me nothing about how much insulin I'm giving myself. It tells me nothing about my cholesterol levels. It tells me nothing about my blood pressure. It tells me nothing about my C-reactive protein levels. And so it's, it's an incomplete indicator of my overall health. It's just one piece of information that I can use to determine whether or not my decision-making process is moving in the right direction or not, okay? So, um, in order to keep your blood glucose in a very tightly controlled window of what Dr. Bernstein recommends and what many people in the carnivore and ketogenic world recommend is even smaller than 70 to 120. They recommend keeping your blood glucose between 80 and 90 or between 80 and 100. I'm talking about a very, very tight window of blood glucose variation on a daily basis. The question is, is that even necessary? And according to non-diabetic individuals, what you'll find is that that's not necessary because there is a range of blood glucose variation that is considered 100% normal that, is, uh, that happens in healthy individuals. So compressing that window to an even smaller range can become very problematic. The only real way that you can get there is to eat the way that they recommend is to eat a low carbohydrate diet because anytime you introduce carbohydrates into your mouth in a significant quantity, you're likely to increase the variability by a little bit, okay? <clears throat> I'm not saying that by eating carbohydrate, your blood glucose has to go beyond 140, but when you introduce carbohydrate, there's gonna be a little bit more variability than when you're eating a very low uh, carbohydrate diet. So <clears throat> it's important to understand that by eating a carnivorous diet or a very low carbohydrate diet, then you actually can suppress your blood glucose values and you can keep them controlled within a very, very, very tight window, just like these, uh, these, these experts recommend. Now for a person living with type one diabetes specifically, that can be very challenging to try and accomplish because it's a very narrow window. And <clears throat> um, what the American Diabetes Association recommends is that a, an acceptable window of blood glucose variation for a person with type one is between 70 and 180. And the reason for that is because when you're injecting your own insulin, you can introduce human error into the process. And human error has to be taken into account, especially because when you inject insulin, you can become hypoglycemic, which become life-threatening. So as a result of that, the, the window of acceptable blood glucose has to increase to accommodate for human error in the insulin injection process. So according to the American Diabetes Association, 70 to 180 is what's considered a quote unquote normal blood glucose variation. But I realize that there's people living with type one diabetes in particular who, who are like, wow, that's, that's too large of a window. I wanna be more tightly controlled. And so the question really becomes, is it possible to eat the way that we recommend, which is by eating a diet that is low in fat, truly low in fat, less than 30 grams of fat per day, and still compress your blood glucose range to within 70 to 140? And if the answer is yes, then great. Eating the way that we recommend is a doable process and something that's gonna to lead to long-term improvements in your overall health. But if the answer is no, Cyrus and Robbie are making things up, or no, maybe it works in them, but it doesn't work in other individuals, then that's cause for concern. We've run thousands of people through our coaching program and we've observed a lot of their blood glucose values over the course of time and we have seen 
over and over, both in those who inject insulin and those who don't inject insulin, that when you migrate towards a low fat diet, less than 30 grams of total fat per day, then you increase your carbohydrate tolerance, which dramatically improves your blood glucose control. So by allowing your muscles and liver the opportunity to uh, absorb and uptake larger amounts of glucose on a meal by meal basis, that right there enables you to eat larger quantities of carbohydrate. And by eating larger quantities of carbohydrate, uh, you can still keep your blood glucose very tightly controlled and achieve a time and range greater than 80%. So Robbie's a perfect example. His time and range often is greater than 95%, and it's very remarkable to see how well controlled his blood glucose is. My, my time and range is a little bit less than his. I usually vary from somewhere between 85% to 95%, depending on a number of factors. I'm also not on a continuous glucose monitor. And as a result of that, both of us have greater than 80% time and range, which is actually a really good thing. And again, we've seen many people go through our program with very similar results. Now, the one thing that I will tell people is that uh, there's many people who say, oh, okay, I did that low fat diet. I tried it and it didn't work. But when you go backwards in time and try and play detective to figure out what actually happened, many people say, okay, I, I tried your diet. I tried it for two weeks. I tried it for three weeks and I found that my blood glucose went high and I got scared. So I, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for me and I don't think it works in general. But it's important to understand that, that optimal blood glucose control takes time, especially if you're injecting insulin, because there are so many variables to take into account. The variables to take into account not only are what are you putting into your mouth, what is the carbohydrate and fat and protein content of those foods, but the time when you inject insulin, your insulin timing, okay? Uh, your carbohydrate to insulin ratio at every single meal is gonna be slightly different. How much basal insulin are you giving yourself and at what time are you giving it to yourself and via what method are you giving it to yourself? Um, what, is the, what is the location of your insulin uh, lo injections? Um, are you using a pump? Are you not using a pump? All of these things matter. And so you can't expect any person who's injecting insulin and trying to change their food at the same time to be able to figure out all of this within a two week period. It's just not possible. And that's why we strongly recommend that people who do make a transition with their diet, whether it's towards the Mastering Diabetes Program or whether it's towards a different regimen, is to take things very slowly. Because small changes can lead to big results. And if you're not systematic about the process by which you go from diet A to diet B, you're likely to get overwhelmed, you're likely to get confused, and you're likely to find that your blood glucose starts to vary more than you want and as a result of that, you'll get frustrated and then you'll leave. Now, from a metabolic perspective, uh, reversing years of tissue dysfunction that has accumulated over the course of time from eating a low carbohydrate diet takes a long time to reverse. So we are, we, we've said this a thousand times and I'll say it again, which is that when you eat a low carbohydrate diet, you are actually uh, dramatically increasing the total quantity of fat in your diet, especially if it comes from animal-based foods, and that can increase the accumulation of fat inside of your liver and inside of your muscle. So the triglyceride deposits inside of your liver increase. The triglyceride deposits inside of your muscle increase. And there's plenty of evidence-based research in humans that demonstrates that when you increase the fat content of your liver and increase the fat content of your muscle, you directly impact insulin action. So the more fat that those two tissues store, the lower insulin action uh, occurs. And by having less insulin action, that means that glucose has a difficult time getting inside of those two tissues, and therefore glucose ends up remaining trapped inside of your blood. So de facto, people who eat a low carbohydrate diet eat more uh, triglyceride. They end up with more triglyceride inside of their liver and inside of their muscle. And as a result of that, their uh, blood glucose often goes higher. It may not happen in the short term, but it definitely happens over the course of time because they're developing more insulin resistance. And so this is reversing that process and getting to a point where your liver can oxidize many of the stored triglycerides that it has accumulated over the course of many months to years takes time. The same thing happens inside of your muscle. Rever oxidizing those stored triglycerides inside of your muscle tissue takes time. So again, anytime people say, you know, I tried your diet for 14 days and it doesn't really work, uh, my suggestion is, okay, we're gonna have to slow things down. 
we're gonna have to change fewer variables and have those variables change at a slower rate. And as a result of that, you're able to determine whether or not your blood glucose control is actually improving. And I have a strong suspicion that it will. Okay, Chris, I just wanna add. So you, I appreciate this comment. The person who wrote the comment was very thorough and uh, I respect the research they've done and the diligence. And so I just wanna say like, we, we wrote about this in detail in chapter seven of our book, comparing a ketogenic diet to a low-fat plant-based whole food diet. And I just wanna be clear, we certainly acknowledge the truth that when you follow a truly low carbohydrate diet, you follow Bernstein's diet, a lot of the people following that, Bernstein himself, they show excellent blood glucose control, um, insane time and range. We're talking like 99%, 100% consistently. Very, very little blood glucose fluctuation. Like this is all facts. The question really becomes, okay, if you follow the low-fat plant-based whole food diet, the, you're going to have more blood glucose variation, but is that healthy? Is that normal? Is that okay? And Cyrus just covered that research. And so, yeah, it's our position that, yes, as people living with type 1 diabetes, that range of 70 to 180 for type 1 diabetes is perfectly acceptable. And you're welcome to nudge it down if you want to be more disciplined. And you absolutely can do that. So I like to make the distinction between what is biologically happening and what's biologically possible versus what's just challenging for humans to execute. So the fact that you can biologically follow a low-fat plant-based whole food diet, living with type 1 diabetes, and inject a physiologically normal amount of insulin and have you know, steady blood glucose is a, a, a fact that basically anybody can experience if they apply it. But then it's the nuanced details and the discipline of just being a human being that is gonna allow you to do that consistently. So there are many, many key variables for people living with type 1 diabetes that you have to master to truly keep it steady on an ongoing basis. Cyrus covered many of them, and the most important ones are for type 1 is insulin timing. Okay, so you have to make sure the insulin is working before you start eating carbohydrate-rich foods. And people are not taught this. They don't understand that at certain times of day, it takes longer for the insulin to begin working. Um, at certain times of day, it's, it's actually it's much shorter. Um, you also have different types of insulin that people are working using. Some people are, are using a long-acting insulin that's not actually working for 24 hours. That causes a lot of confusion for people. Your activity is going to be important, but also how fast you eat is going to be very important for that blood glucose elevation. And what are you eating with your higher carbohydrate foods? Are you including greens? Are you including non-starchy vegetables? Has your activity been consistent? You know, for females, now we're incorporating the menstrual cycle, how that's impacting your insulin sensitivity. So we can go on and on and on. I mean, talk about, you know, stress, sleep. There are a lot of variables. And that is why we are so passionate about this and why we created a coaching program. This is why we started Mastering Diabetes. And a lot of these nuances apply to type 2 as well, especially in the beginning. They certainly apply to insulin-dependent type 2, type 1.5, people who got diagnosed with gestational diabetes and have been prescribed insulin. Like, there's just a ton of nuances in the application of this science. But I will stand by this until one human being shows me that I'm incorrect. I will stand by this. I have yet to see somebody come to us using insulin, because this is the most factual thing that nobody can argue with. Like you are using insulin, you're counting your carbohydrate intake. And as you begin to lower that fat intake and eat whole carbohydrates, you will see objectively, factually, you cannot argue that insulin works more efficiently. You need less insulin to metabolize more and more carbohydrate. I have yet to see an exception in our coaching program, at our retreats. I have never had somebody DM us on Instagram and say, look, I did exactly what you said. I followed the meal plan in the book and I didn't become more insulin sensitive. I've never seen that comment. So this commenter is explicitly talking about blood glucose control. And that for type one really comes down to your understanding of the details, of the nuances. And if you really truly, like I wear a Dexcom G6, I've been playing this game for a long time. I know for a fact, if you are very disciplined, you follow the system, and you want to stay between 70 and 140, you could do that. The number one variable that's going to change that for somebody is how fast you eat. If you eat slow and something went wrong with your insulin timing or you weren't as active 
and it's rising too quickly, all you'd have to do is pause for 15, 20 minutes, eat the rest of the meal, and you could control it all day long. Of course, you have to do all the basics right, but it's within your control. And that's a message I just want everybody to know, and it's possible, and you can do it. Nobody here ever said it was easy, but it's worth it. So what about the size of meals and timing of meals? Like, you know, if you eat three meals, for me, if I eat three meals a day, I tend to eat bigger meals, um, a big bowl of oatmeal for breakfast with fruit. Uh, whereas if I can snack, which I think I saw you guys doing with bananas, um, in between meals, you, you tend to eat a little less. Does that matter? Does it make a difference? Well, I mean, it, it's like, well, you're, it's a very nuanced question again, because the size of the meal um, it's going to depend on how much carbohydrate-rich food are we talking about. Sometimes the size of the meal could be large because you're eating, you know, a lot of greens, um, a lot of non-starchy vegetables. But if you're more active, that's going to require more carbohydrate content. And because you're more active, you're going to become more insulin sensitive. So it kind of balances itself out. But yes, depending on how insulin resistant somebody is coming into the program, um, splitting meals in half to, you know, to flatten out your blood glucose curve and get the calories you need is a strategy that we have found to be effective.